All right. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Code as a Crime Scene. Today, I'm going to talk about strategies. Strategies to deal with the complexity of large-scale software projects. And I always find complexity fascinating, because complexity is in itself complex, right? Uh, it's not just a technical aspect of our solutions. We have an organizational dimension, too. The way we choose to organize influences how our code looks. So I'm going to talk about that today. I'm also going to talk a lot about interactions and interaction patterns. And what I mean by that is how we interact with our code. What parts of the code are we modifying? What kind of modifications are we doing? And of course, what's the nature of the very code that we're modifying? And my idea is that if we somehow manage to mine and analyze this data, it will give us a lot of valuable information. It will be information that we can use for technical decision making, to identify um, design issues in our code, and uh, identify a team productivity bottlenecks. And as we will see, that data will even be able to point out possible future refactorings for us. So, it's a really interesting venue, this. And uh, I will have a problem looking up at you. It's, it's a shame, because you're a really beautiful crowd, I can tell you that. But the important thing is that you see well. So, let's get started with a small motivating example on why I think this is so important. My first point here, maintenance. It's a personal favorite of mine. I spent many years of my career working on old legacy systems. Systems that had code in them that were 15, 20 years old, and the original developers were since long gone. And we had modules in that code. And the people working on the code, myself included, we were literally scared to go into them and make changes. Because it was so hard to reason about the consequence of a change. So, if you, at that time, hooked in on our discussions, you soon get the idea that maintenance was somehow a problem that we needed to solve. And since then, I became a little bit wiser, and I understood that maintenance is not a problem. Maintenance is actually a good thing. And why is that? It's because maintenance means that we have users. Only successful software gets maintained. So maintenance is a good thing. It means that's, that we will have a job. But, of course, maintenance is expensive. And um, does anyone know how much do we pay for maintenance? The, take the total life cycle cost of a product. Any ideas? Sorry? Ten times. Ten times? Any other ideas? Come on, just shout some numbers at me. Great. Uh, well, it turns out that if you take the total life cycle cost, you spend approximately, it differs between products, but approximately 40 to 80 percent of your total life cycle cost on maintenance. That makes maintenance the most significant phase in any product's life cycle. So, it's a lot of money. What do we get for those money? I mean, software, it's not like... It's a bit different, because it doesn't wear down in a traditional way. We don't have to oil it up to keep it going. So, what do we get for all those money? Well, it turns out that most of the time, what we're doing in that maintenance phase is modifications to existing programs. And this is the most important thing I'm going to tell you today, because to me, that means that if we want to optimize any aspect of software development, we have to optimize for maintenance. We have to make it as cheap and simple and risk-free as possible to modify existing code. Right? And one way that we do that is by refactorings, of course. And what I'm talking about today, it's not those small automatable refactorings, like renaming a variable or extracting a method. Those are really important. Those are the foundation. But I'm going to talk more about redesigns things that have a fundamental impact on how our high-level view looks. And those kind of changes, they are expensive and they are high-risk. So when we do them, we want to ensure that we're modifying the right thing. We also want to have a pretty good idea that we take the code in the right direction, right? 
So I hope to show you some techniques today that will help us, that will guide us on that journey. Another favorite topic of mine, parallel development. And uh, this has nothing to do with threads or multi-cores and stuff like that. What I'm talking about here is the challenge of scaling software development from individual developers to teams of developers and perhaps groups of teams. And it's a terribly hard problem. It's a really hard problem. And the we as an industry are notoriously bad at this point. And when I do this presentation, I always ask, uh, how many of you have read Fred Brooks' The Mythical Man Month? Hands up, please. Approximately one third of you. Uh, it's, and how many of you like the book? Oh, it was a subset. It's a, a personal favorite of mine. It's a really good book. I strongly recommend it. And uh, I'm going to come back to Fred Brooks and the Mythical Man Month. But for now, just let me leave you with a quote. Fred Brooks says that adding more manpower to a late project makes it even later. And I'm going to come back to why that's the case, indeed. And uh, as I started to do software development professionally, and with professionally, I just mean that somebody started to pay me for doing what I always did for fun anyway. And one of the things I noticed was that we don't always know what we do in software projects. And even when we, did, when we do, we don't know when we are done. So what I'm after here today is some kind of technique that could give us a hint. Oh yes, you're approaching completion, or no, you probably have much more surprising work left. I'll come back to that. Finally, I'll spend some minutes on uh, test automation. And uh, this is an area where I worked uh, quite extensively over the last years. And I mean, we all know the benefits of test automation. But what we rarely talk about is the cost. Because test automation is terribly hard to get right in practice. And when we fail, those automated tests become time sinks for the teams. Now, uh, complexity in software, it's nothing new. It's been there since the dawn of time, basically. And we have tried to find different ways to cope with it. And this is one approach, complexity measures. We actually have metrics to measure complexity in software. And I've used this, these metrics quite a lot over the last 10 years. And uh, just to give you a few examples, uh, the graph on the top it's cyclomatic complexity developed by McCabe. And uh, it's a, quite a well-known measure. And I guess that some of you are using it. Anyone using cyclomatic complexity? A few, approximately 15 people. Yeah, I, I use it myself a lot. And the basic idea with cyclomatic complexity, just to give you an idea of these measures, is that you, it's a function level metric. So, you take your function and you consider it a graph and then you calculate the number of possible paths through it. And the higher that number, the more decision points, the higher the complexity. And it makes sense because each decision point, each possible path through a function is something I need to keep in my head when I reason about that function or method. And the area I, I use, a working memory in my brain, uh, that's a strictly limited cognitive resource. That's really just so much I can hold in my head at once. So I would say that McCabe, it definitely makes sense, right? It's related to cognitive load. We have other metrics too, uh, stuff like coupling. When you have uh, afferent coupling, how many different components depend upon me? That's basically the cost of changing me. We have afferent coupling, how many different components do I depend on? And that's basically the risk that I will have to change. So I would say that makes sense too. What's the problem with metrics? The problem I have with complexity metrics is that they are pretty bad at measuring complexity. Because it turns out, and let me show you a quote here, so I can back up my claims. Syntactic complexity metrics cannot capture the whole picture of software complexity. 
And this is a quote from two researchers that actually put these metrics to work to measure complexity. But what they found out was that as soon as they started to control for the number of lines of code, those metrics didn't add any further predictive value. Wow, number of lines of code. That's a pretty rough metric, isn't it? Is that the best we can do? Here's another quote. This one is a personal favorite because it's a little bit evil. The use of metrics to manage software projects has not even reached a state of infancy. Robert Gloss, who said that, is one of my favorite writers on software. Check out his writings, he's brilliant. He writes about this stuff and other things. Uh, he means that in open-ended, complex areas like software for decision-making, we have to rely on our intuition. Now, intuition is interesting because intuition is an unconscious process. And what that means is that Intuition, I see something on screen here, something in my code editor. What happens is now that over the years I've accumulated some expertise, we've all done that. We know a lot about software development, our favorite languages, and something in that situation, something that I see, triggers recall to some of that accumulated knowledge, and it becomes conscious, and I, boom, I get this insight. The problem is, since it's an unconscious process, I don't really have control over what kind of information that gets recalled. And as such, like all unconscious processes in our brain, intuition is uh, quite prone to uh, social and cognitive biases. And there's really no way for us to avoid them, unfortunately. The second problem with relying on intuition is that intuition doesn't scale. No matter how good programmers we are, there's no way that we can scale our intuition and expertise to systems of hundreds of thousands or even million lines of code. There's really no way to do that. So what I set out to find was, were some kind of techniques that could take all those large systems and narrow them down to a few hotspots that I could manually investigate. Right? And to find them, I decided to look outside our field of software into a different field that faces similar problems like ours. Welcome to the field of forensic psychology. And, and I think forensic psychology is interesting because we've all been exposed to that through the movies and through the media. And, um, When I give this presentation, my favorite example is uh, a movie called Silence of the Lambs. Anyone seen that one? Oh, almost everyone, perfect. Hands up again, how many agree with me that uh, Hannibal Lecter is the coolest character? <laughs> He's great, really. And we can learn a lot from him. Because... <laughs> oh, that was a square, scary thing to say. <laughs> Please don't quote me. <laughs> Um, anyway, Hannibal Lecter, he sits in his cage and he, be he becomes information about the crimes committed, about the crime scene, and from that information alone, he deduces not only a personality profile of the offender, but also about his motives and motivations. It's quite amazing, right? And I, when I started to study criminal psychology, I was really looking forward to learning those techniques. But uh, my professor told me that, hey, there's a small problem with them. They only work in Hollywood movies. So, but he taught me something else, and uh, it's something more valuable and something that I think we can apply to software as well. So please allow me to give you a two minutes introduction to geographic profiling of criminals. And I do that uh, with a little small case study. Uh, First thing I want to say is that, and this surprised me because it's so obvious in a way, uh, that most of the times criminals, they behave just like the rest of us. They go to the movies, they go shopping, they go to restaurants, they meet with friends, perhaps they even pick up the kids from school. And as they walk around in an area, that's where they spot the opportunities for crime. Because, of course, for a crime to occur, there has to be some overlap in time and space between an offender and a victim, right? Now, what does that mean to us? It means that the crime scenes, their locations, are never random. 
they contain information about the criminal, and we can use that. And I show you how. Please let me take you back to 19th century London, to the Whitechapel area, and the era of Jack the Ripper. What you see there, those blue spots, labeled spots, those are the crime scenes of the Ripper. Now, what we do in geographic offender profiling is that we consider each crime scene a center of gravity, and then we weight them all together, but with one small important twist. Since psychologically all distances aren't equal, we tend to assign more weight to crime scenes that are closer to each other. Now, that gives us a new center of gravity. You see that red area in the middle? And according to the research on this, we have a 70% chance that our offender will have his home base in that red area. All right, if we take a step back and consider what we've done now, we've taken this potentially vast area and narrowed it down to a much smaller hotspot. And that's the area that we can focus our expertise on. That's where we put our intuition to work. That's the area we want to supervise if we want to find a ripper. And I thought, like, wow, what if I had something like this for my software systems, for those large legacy systems? Something that allowed me to take all those million lines of code and narrow them down. I'll show you how in a minute. But first, I mean, you know, Jack the Ripper, he was never cocked. And you probably want to know, do these techniques really work? So I'll show you how, who the Ripper was. <laughs> Please meet James Maybrick. James Maybrick, a Liverpool cotton merchant, and uh, he's a historic person. And um, 20 years ago, an interesting document surfaced. It was a diary written by James Maybrick, and James Maybrick claims to be the Ripper. It's quite a detailed document, very interesting. But the most interesting thing for us is that James Maybrick writes in that diary that as he went to London to do business, which he did quite frequently, he rented a room in the Middlesex Street. You see where the Middlesex Street is? That blue line? Right in the middle of our hotspot. So, again, I'm not sure that James Maybrick was Jack the Ripper, but if you ever have to bet money on who he was, James Maybrick is my best advice. Okay. Let's leave all these horrors behind and move on to something much more pleasant. Let's talk a bit about software. If we want to apply these techniques to software, what's the first thing we need? Of course, we need a geography of code. And here's one approach. There are many ways to visualize software, and this one is one of my favorites. It's called uh, Code City. And, uh, in case this is a Java system, what you do is that you consider each package in your code a city block. And each class becomes a building. And the height of the building is given by its number of methods, and its space is given by its number of attributes. So the larger the building, the more complex it is, right? And if I had to base my decisions on this data, I would immediately go for those large buildings, because clearly that's where the problems are. But I will say, that doesn't bring us forward. That's nothing else than our pure complexity metrics. Right? And I would say that complexity in itself is not a problem. Complexity is only a problem when I have to deal with it. If that code been stable for five years in production, it works perfectly, we have no bugs reported on it, I mean, why should I care? Perhaps I will one day, but right now I probably have more urgent matters. So, I will claim that this view is incomplete. We need more information. And I will also claim that uh, to understand a complex entity such as a software system, we can never do that from a static snapshot. We need to look at the evolution of the system. We need to understand how it became what it is today. And that's actually information that most of us already have in our version control systems. So let's look at that. Here's a different view of the system. This is a heat map where each module is represented as a square. And the size of the square now 
depends on how many revisions we have of that module. So, roughly, the larger the square, larger its area, the more effort we spent on it. Hmm. Perhaps. Because what this view says, okay, it gives us some different information, but still we don't know it. Consider this one, for example, app.cle. But we don't know anything about the code behind it. Perhaps that's a simple configuration file, and it's natural for us to go into it and modify it. Consider the offers module over here. Perhaps it's perfectly designed, and there's really no way to worry. So I will claim that while this is interesting information, it's not sufficient. What I think that we need is to merge these two views and become something like this. Ah, now we see. This is actually an overlap between complexity and effort. So we immediately see I have used column markup to indicate where we spend our efforts. So we see that upper area there, that's where we actually work. That's the area, that's our hotspots. That's what we should consider and put our intuition to work at. And uh, I will come back to this visualization soon. First, let's talk a little bit about parallel work again. Remember I talked about Fred Brooks, the Mythical Man Month, adding more manpower to a late project makes it even later? The reason that is, according to Brooks, is because of the additional communication overhead. The work that gets done increases linearly, but the communication need increases almost exponentially. Right? And uh, I also think that we have a quality issue there too, because when we people have to communicate around deep technical details, things often go wrong. It's terribly hard. And th there's actually some research to back up my claim. And what the research just found was that um, the number of post-release defects in a component was strongly related to the number of offers that module had. So the more people working in parallel on a particular module, the more post-release defects. And uh, I will claim that it's, we have a third aspect of parallel work, and it's related to learning. Because think about this, you go into and you start to work on a new system, and uh, you get assigned a task, pick up the code, read through it, learn a bit, make your change, test it, commit. A week later, come into the same code, you read a bit, learn a bit more, and uh, make your change and commit it. And so, over time, you're accumulating knowledge. Your understanding of the system grows. Now, what I've seen happen with extensive parallel work is that you open up that code and, and what? It looks completely different. It's nothing like it used to be last week. My changes have been rewritten or deleted or uh, other parts of the code have been modified. And uh, to me, that's a waste of cognitive cycles. And you can actually use uh, exactly the same visualization to spot the um, hotspots based on parallel work, because that's information that we have recorded too. So instead of showing number of revisions, you could show number of offers per module. And it will give you a slightly different view. All right, uh, that were a few examples of the kind of information that we have available and that we can use to our advantage. I want to show you a few more techniques. And uh, I want to introduce the next one uh, with a movie. And it will be a movie that's quite as dramatic as Silence of the Lambs. This will be about life and death in a software system. Please enjoy. No, dramatic, isn't it? That's actually a system growing. I'm replaying uh, version control data. And uh, each module in that system is visualized as a box there. And every time I make a change to it, it grows. So the larger the buildings, the, the more revisions. At the same time, what I also do is that... Um, wait, let's play it one more time so you can see it. What I also do is that I um, use some color markup. Every time I change something, 
I increase the intensity of the color. So the building becomes a bit more red. And when I don't do any changes, the building cools down. And that allows me to spot different modification patterns. You see those two red squares there? Those cubes? This let me spot patterns, uh, patterns of simultaneous modification. And consider this now. What you see is that quite often different modules tend to be changed together in the same commit. What does that mean to us? Anyone has a good idea? Dependent. Dependent, thanks. Great. Of course, they depend on each other. Something like this. You have two uh, modules here, and uh, they keep changing together, and uh, you probably can't read it. Or it's, One of them is called git, and the other one is called git test. So, we have the application code and the unit test for that code, and it's, I mean, I would really expect them to have a dependency, and I would really expect them to be changed together, because this system was developed using test driven development, so it's quite natural that they grow together. It's also not particularly interesting, because this is stuff that we already know, right? What I think is interesting are the patterns that break my expectations. The patterns where modules keep changing together without any explicit dependency between them. And that's a kind of coupling that's called uh, logical coupling, sometimes change coupling or temporal coupling. And here's one example of that. What I got here are, um, it's one command line interface and one module called SVN. And they don't have any dependency between them. Yet they keep changing together and together and together. Hmm, interesting. Could be different reasons for that. Uh, when I look into those kind of problems, uh, the most common reason is copy-paste. You know, you have some code here and I need something similar over here. Oh, copy-paste, perfect, problem solved. But now I have to remember to change both of my copies and they will keep changing together, right? Uh, another quite common case is that you have the publisher or subscriber of some kind of information. And in that case, I, it may be act actually be okay, but you don't know before you looked at it. And I will um, illustrate this, again, logical coupling, uh, with a small case study done on the Firefox project. This is a small subset of the Firefox code base. And what the researchers did here was that they um, looked into Firefox and looked which modules tend to change together at least 80% of the time. 80%, that's a huge number. So those modules are really heavily coupled, I would say. And what they found out was that most of the time it looks like this. Browser places changes together with toolkit places. Browser themes changes together with toolkit themes. And Really, this looks deliberate. This looks like an architectural principle, right? And it's actually quite a simple rule to remember. Modules with the same name under different top-level packages change together. It's actually quite good. And it's also not particularly interesting. Again, the interesting thing are those patterns that break the principle, like this one. They found that 80% of the time, toolkit content and toolkit themes tended to change together. Now, what I do when I find this kind of data is I look deeper. And since this is a record in our version control systems, we can go in and we can compare different files and we can compare them line by line. And I promise you, most of the time when I do that, I find that um, you will find some kind of common module just looking to get out. And once you extract that code and refactor towards that solution, your problem goes away. So uh, I think this is a really powerful technique and an excellent guide for uh, large-scale refactorings. Let's move on. Uh, automated tests. Again, uh, I put this in place because I wanted some simple feedback on 
when I start to spend too much effort on my tests. And again, I'm talking about uh, system level tests and not unit tests. Those would look a little bit different, I think. Uh, but what I did here was that I just grouped my source code on application code, test code, and then I kept monitoring the number of uh, revisions of each of those pools. And the interesting thing is, of course, not the absolute numbers. The interesting thing here is the trend. And what I would expect in a perfect world is something around our T2, T3, where the upper line is the production code and then have my test code. I spend a little bit more effort on my application code, right? If suddenly I detect a rise in steepness there of the test code, that I start to spend more and more effort on my tests, that's a warning sign. It may be okay if you have a good explanation for it. Perhaps you're refactoring your test framework or something, and that may actually be okay. But if you don't have any explanation, that's a warning sign. Because otherwise you run into this risk of this uh, test death marsh. And it's worse, it's automated. And where you actually you know you make a small change to application code and suddenly you have 10 failing test cases that you have to fix, that really drags development down. But there's more information we can gain here. And uh, again, this is a trend-based measurement. Uh, it's a concept called code churn. It's something I, I really like, code churn. Is anyone familiar with it, code churn? Not so many people. So I'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, code churn is basically uh, the amount of code that we are changing at a particular point in time. How many lines do we modify? How many lines do we delete? How many lines do we add? That's our churn. And again, the interesting thing is never the absolute numbers. The interesting things are the trends and patterns. And I'll show you some examples. What we get here is uh, a typical churn pattern. The upper blue line, that's the total number of lines of code over time. We can see how it changes. And below, we have the amount of churn. How much of the code are we changing? And this pattern is something that I would expect in case we are doing things like continuous integration. As we approach our completion date, the system becomes more and more stable and our churn shrinks. Right? Another pattern that I've seen a few times, and this one really puzzled me the first time I saw it. It's called the camel pattern. It's, uh, you see, you have the, the churn at the bottom, nothing happens, then you get a huge spike, again, nothing happens, a spike, nothing happens, a new spike, and I, I was like, wow, what's going on here? And as I started to investigate it, I found out that there's always a fixed time span between those different peaks. It's always two or three weeks. Hmm, what's going on? And I actually, come to the conclusion that what we're seeing there is a reflection of the ways of working. This actually tells us something about the process that these developers were using. And what we can learn is that, yes, they're using interactive development, an iteration of two weeks. And what happens is actually that as they start an iteration, the developers branch out for different features and start to churn along on their feature branches, and suddenly, oh, no, we have a deadline, a demo, we need to integrate, and they start to merge the code together, and that's where we become the peak. So each peak is a deadline, a demo. And I think that deadline do bring out the worst in people, because to me there's no obvious reason that every feature should take exactly two or three weeks. So I think some of these features are probably, God forbid, rushed to completion. But even if we somehow manage to control the quality on each individual branch, we don't know what happens when those features get integrated. And we run the risk of uh, unexpected feature interaction, and that's actually some of the nastiest bugs you can have. So if you see that, that's a problem, and you have to work quite actively uh, with the method and process that the team is using to address this. This is not a technical issue. 
another pattern, and this is interesting because code churn has been shown to be strongly correlated with the number of post-release defects. The higher the churn in a module, the more post-release defects in that one. And this is again something I use as an early warning system. If I see a pattern like this, I'm approaching a deadline and my churn is rising. Then I know that I'm probably in for quite a nasty surprise. I will probably have a lot of bugs, undiscovered bugs, waiting for me, and that deadline is in risk. All right. I'm almost done now. Just to show you one more small thing I'm using. You know, I really don't want to apply that we are Jack the Ripper, but you know, as I, as I said, uh, the crime scenes, the location of them, contain information about the offender. And in the same way, our commits contain information about us. So what I did here is I just joined all commit messages and threw them into a word cloud. And it's not something I use on a regular basis, but this is something I use to get uh, discussions going and to get a different perspective on what we are doing as a team. And uh, it's something I recommend. It's quite simple to do, and uh, the things that pop up there, in some, in some way, that's things that we spend effort on. In this case, you see error handling. Oh, interesting. It may give a different perspective, and I find it quite valuable. All right. I'm going to wrap this up and um, look a little bit in the crystal ball and see where this is heading. First of all, uh, I've been talking a lot today about how we write code, but I think an even harder problem to solve is how to read code. And uh, I also think that um, we will get systems that are integrated with our IDEs in a much better way, uh, systems that are able to record what ha what's happening between two commits. And I think that could give us really useful information. For example, I guess you're all familiar with Amazon, their book recommendation system. And picture this, you're uh, opening a file in your favorite editor and suddenly you get a small pop-up that says, hey, programmer, um, other programmers that read this code also checked out this and that module. I think that could be really useful and it's definitely doable. Uh, another thing uh, that I see coming are uh, dynamic predictions. And uh, this is an idea I saw first at uh, uh, Google. I know that Google use a similar system for their uh, bugs. Uh, Google know that bugs tend to cluster. So if you check out code that has had a lot of bugs, you get a small warning that says, hey, watch out, this uh, is buggy code. Now, what happens is, over time, uh, that code gets fixed. It gets refactored, it gets rewritten, and the bugs disappear. So, their algorithms are time aware. So, if no more bugs are reported, that hotspot, that buggy hotspot, cools down and the warning disappears. And I would like to see the same thing happening here with this data I've been showing you today. That, you know, you check out some code and you get a small warning, hey, watch out, we have extensive parallel work here. There have been three other developers within this same module over the last hour. And that's possible already today. And I think that could be really useful uh, information for us when we are trying to address some of our concerns. Now, before I leave you and um, leave this session open to more questions, I um, want to give you a few links. Uh, first one you see here is, um, I've actually written down some of this stuff I talked about today and some other stuff. And uh, yeah, it's available on my page. Uh, the second link is uh, a tool I've been developing. It's a prototype for uh, doing some of these analysis I showed you today. And it's, it's open source, it's free as in speech. And uh, to go with the theme of the conference, it's written in Clojure, so it contains a lot of lambdas. And um, yeah, finally, if you... If you want to discuss some of this stuff and uh, are interested in learning more about these techniques or software development or want to know more about Jack the Ripper, I'll be around for the rest of the conference and I'm really happy to discuss this. I love to share this stuff. So, 
Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you. Oh. We have time for some questions. Any questions? Yes. You talk, you talk mainly about maintenance. Are there any different issues when you new develop uh, a new project? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, I yes, I will. Uh, I talk a lot about maintenance. Uh, what's the differences on a greenfield project? Uh, I would say there are small differences. The most obvious thing is that in order to make a good decision, you need some data. Uh, so this is not something you could start to do immediately, but let's say after a... It depends on the uh, scale of the project, the scale of the product, but say already after a few weeks, I think you could start to get the measurements in place and start to spot the trends. And I also think it's interesting because what I've seen today is that the line between maintenance and greenfield development starts to blur. With agile practices, what we're doing is that we effectively, immediately put uh, software into maintenance mode. And that, I think that's the nature of iterative development. As soon as we start to do that, we face the same problems as maintenance programmers faces, but earlier. So I don't think it's a big difference. Any other questions? Okay, as I said, just uh, talk to me later, I'll be happy to share. Thanks again. <laughs>